the commentary of Rashi and myself on Isaiah 52 verses 13 through 15 and all of Isaiah 53 describing God's righteous servant the Moshiach according to my commentary which includes commentary on the commentary of Rashi. Rashi's commentary is that the man being described is Israel, which means it's not the Moshiach of chapter 11, and which also means we have no description of him. 52.13 Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and he shall be very high. Rashi. This is Midrash form. He takes parts of verses and comments on the parts. And he'll, he doesn't necessarily take all the verse, but the parts he wants to comment on. And this is how he starts. Behold, my servant shall prosper. Behold, this is Rashi now. Behold, at the end of days, my servant Jacob, i.e., the righteous among him shall prosper. Keith. And I'm using the JPS. Uh, this is from Shabbat.org. They have the rendition that doesn't include the quotes between 13 and 15 and the quotes between verse 1 and 6 of uh, 53. The multiple quote verses. This is from the JPS. Indeed, my servant shall prosper, be exalted, and raised to great heights. My commentary on that is, my servant is now the Gentile, and not the exiles, who becomes my righteous servant. In Isaiah 53, 11, after passing the test of devotion in Isaiah 53, 10. When he makes himself an offering for guilt in the covenant with God. From a sinful man whose life had been lowly, full of grievous events and serious injuries, a man of pain and suffering, familiar with disease, that the Spirit of God alights upon, to the crown of God's righteous servant who rises to great heights. This is uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. Chapter 11 begins with, Spirit of God alights upon the twig of the shoot that grows from the stump of Jesse, where the ancestral tree of the kings of Judah has been cut down. That would be the line of Jesus in the book of Matthew. It's the first thing you read in the New Testament. He can't be the man of chapter 11. That's not just because that line was banished with Jeconia when Babylonia took over, uh, defeated the Jews, and destroyed the second temple, but because he doesn't come from the stump. That's why it's written that way. The stock of Jesse that has remained standing shall become a standard to peoples, nations shall seek his counsel, and his abode shall be honored. Again, Isaiah 11.10. The abode of the righteous servant is humble when the Lord cuts him off from the land of the living, the world of material things in society. In Isaiah 53, verse 8. And in the end, the abode of the servant is one to be honored. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. From a poor man to a rich man, with the many as his portion and the multitude as his spoil, prosperous and held in high regard by many and the multitude of the Jewish people. Verse 14. As many wondered about you, how marred his appearance is from that of a man and his features from that of people. Rashi. That's, that's again from Shabbat.org and, and the commentary comes from, from them too. They have the commentary of Rashi on that. 
As many wondered, his answer, commentary, as many peoples wondered about them when they saw them in their humble state and said to one another, how marred is his, Israel's, that's in brackets, appearance from that of a man. See how their features are darker than those of other people? So, as we see with our eyes. This is Keith, verse 14. Just as the many were appalled at him, so marred was his appearance, unlike that of man, his form beyond human semblance. Commentary. So marred was his appearance, unlike that of man. Based on Isaiah 53, verse 10, and its primary purpose, this is the beginning of identifying the righteous servant as a man with disfigurement, blemished, with disease. He is not a man without defect, such as lambs for sin offerings and rams for guilt offerings. In the Torah, that would be Leviticus. If I were to be seen with all of my injuries from accidents and surgical operations at one time before healing, together with my con congenital disfigurement, my right shoulder and arm is withered, my appearance and features would be marred from the bed of a man and people, unlike that of normal men. And it's important because if you can find a way to describe to describe uh, this man as so marred and his parents. I mean, it sounds like somebody you'd never want to look upon. But in this verse, verse 15, it is said, So shall he cast down many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For what had not been told them they saw, and what they had not heard they gazed. Rashi. What had not been told them, his answer, commentary, concerning any man they saw in him. They gazed. So shall he cast down many nations. Uh, he just puts a Hebrew word in here. I, I don't know. They gazed. It says Hebrew, Hebrew letters. And then again, he says they gazed. So shall he cast down many nations. Rashi. So now even he, his hand, will become powerful. And he will cast down the horns of the nations who scattered him. That would be the Jewish people scattering the nations. Becoming powerful. Shall shut. They shall shut their mouths at a great bewilderment for, he says, honor. They're going to shut their mouths, all this, uh, see what they had never uh, been told and hear what they had never heard. Or honor. Keith. Just so he shall startle many nations, kings shall be silenced because of him, for they shall see what has not been told them, shall behold what they never have heard. My answer to that, nations, the Gentiles, startled, and kings, leaders of nations, silenced. By seeing God's righteous servant, God's servant David, Elijah, and the prophet like Moses as one man. And hearing that God's righteous servant arrives in the time to come of Jeremiah 31 in the day of the Lord. That God's righteous servant is the only man to come who is described in the scripture and is inherently and implicitly the anointed one David, Elijah, and the prophet like Moses, of whom there is no description for identification that the Jewish people throughout the world will be forgiven by God of all their inequities and sins by God's written word in the day of the Lord. 
That would be the new part of the new covenant, the new inclusion from Jeremiah 31. That heaven is being created for only the Jewish people. Christians will be surprised at that, as will Muslims. That God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53 is a Gentile, according to the scripture. That Jesus, being a Jew, cannot be God's righteous servant. That God's righteous servant is familiar with disease and crushed with disease, blemished, and could never be an offer for sacrifice. No man of Isaiah 53 can fit and offer sacrifice. That's why God blemishes him. That's why God chooses to crush him with disease, to make sure that just doesn't happen. Because he knew what the Gentiles were going to do with Leviticus. That a host of the Lord's host is a man and divine beings. That the captain of the Lord's host is a Gentile host of the Lord's hosts and a harbinger of God's righteous servant. That God's righteous servant becomes a man and divine beings when God's spirit, who is the angel of his presence, and he is a person, the angel of the Lord, the Holy Spirit alights upon him in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 2, that God would really redeem the Jewish people and in the same manner that he did in the Hebrew Bible with one man. At the time to come of Jeremiah 31 began when the state of Israel was created in 1948. The God's righteous servant fulfills and completes the remaining six or so prophecies of God in the day of the Lord. Okay, this is uh, Isaiah 53, verse 1, begins with quotes, and the quotes end after verse 6. The first speakers of Isaiah 53 are the witnesses of the righteous servant, in the quoted multiple verses 1 through 6, the many who are made righteous, by God's righteous servant. That's what the story is about. Verse 1. Who would have believed our report? And to whom was the arm of the Lord revealed? Rashi. Who would have believed our report? Rashi. Commentary. So will the nations say to one another. Were we to hear from others what we see it would be unbelievable. I'm not certain what they see, but I think it's the Messianic era. Which is never going to occur. So I don't know how you can base your opinions, and I know Jews for Judaism for sure does it. Not so much Toby is saying of outreach Judaism. If you're going to base a description on a man you're trying to find on an event that has not occurred, whether it will or will not, what about the man who's being described, if that is the case? What have you done? What if you don't recognize him? Utter destruction comes to the land of Israel. And right now, that would be the destruction of 7 million Israeli Jews. If you had been told by a prophet, both of you two, Jews for Jews, outright Jews, if, if your organizations have been told by a prophet, God said he was going to raise up armies if we didn't do this and we didn't do that. And we know what happened. Syria defeated the port of the North Kingdom, South Kingdom, Judah. The Babylonians defeated and deported. And then Rome destroyed and defeated all of them and dispersed the Jews throughout the world. Because why? Because the prophet wasn't listening to it. The arm of the Lord. This is still Rashi. Like this, with greatness and glory, to whom was it revealed until now? He's, not a lot of explanation there, I'm not sure. Keith, who can believe what we have heard? Upon whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? My commentary. The witnesses ask, who can believe that God redeems the Jewish people by the new covenant with sin forgiveness? that is delivered by the messenger Elijah, who receives it from the angel of the covenant, Elijah being a man of heaven, of course, who is the angel of his presence, 
the Holy Spirit that alights upon the anointed one. In Isaiah chapter 11, 1 through 2. By the covenant of friendship that comes with his servant David, when he, and that's God, sanctifies Israel by having the third temple built on his holy Mount Zion in Jerusalem. I gotta see, I lost track here a little bit. Oh, who can believe what we have heard? Okay, that's what all these buys. By speaking to his prophet, again, as he spoke to Moses face to face and friend to friend, and all by and with one man the Lord calls my righteous servant. Chapter 12 of the laws concerning King Moshiach of Ramnam. That Moshiach will compel all of Israel to walk in the way of the Torah, perfect the entire world, motivating all the nations to serve God together. There will be neither famine nor war, neither envy nor competition. The entire world will be solely to know God. And the Jews will, therefore, be great sages and know the hidden matters of with an understanding of their creator to the full extent of human potential. Yet God simply says, and this comes through the two covenants of friendship in the sentence uh, in Jeremiah 31, see a time is coming, Jerusalem is rebuilt. At the end of that it says, they shall never be defeated and dispersed again. Here's what those say for the day of the Lord the era of the Moshiach or the times of the anointed one in the awesome, fearful day of the Lord. Yet God simply says he will send down the rain in its season. The trees of the field shall yield their fruit and the land shall yield its produce. The Jewish people shall continue secure on their own soil, never be overthrown and uprooted again. They shall no longer be a spoil for the nations. He will establish for them a planting of renown. And again, these kind of go in hand with see that the time is coming, the desolate land will bloom again, as I paraphrase it, of Jeremiah 31. They shall no more be carried off by famine. They shall have to bear again. They shall not have to bear again the taunts of the nations. He will establish them and multiply them. He will place his sanctuary among them forever. His presence shall rest over them. And when his sanctuary abides among them forever, the nations will know that the Lord sanctifies Israel. Who would believe that one man fulfills and completes the remaining prophecies of God in the day of the Lord? The remaining prophecy to be fulfilled is the delivery of two specific covenants and the arrival of God's righteous servant who makes the many righteous, the anointed one, a shepherd, God calls my servant David, Elijah, who is taken to heaven and returns and recounsels the members of the Jewish families one to the other through Judaism, Judaism, and righteousness. And the prophet like Moses, who wrote the Torah at the command and direction of God? The witness is real poor, and who would believe them? That they had not been told by their wise men, sages, rabbis, theologians, that God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53 is a Gentile. In the beginning. Isaiah 63 says God comes from a dawn that is interpreted in Judaism to be Christianity. It means he is coming from a Christian country. In addition, a dawn, uh, which is long since gone, is in the country Jordan, east of the river Jordan. It's Gentile lands. He's coming from Gentile lands. And the people, the Jewish people, none are with him. He comes with a Gentile. Remember the captain of the Lord's host. Joshua asked him, are you an Israelite or one of us? He says, no. I'm the captain of the Lord's host. Now I've come. And then we never see him again. It's just three short verses. What are they about? 
And there are better men and divine beings being a host of the Lord's hosts. He comes with a Gentile. Well, Jesus was a Jewish man who came from Nazareth. Can you see God working in this? <laughs> the Jewish people. Isaiah 53 can't be him. He's a Jew. And God comes with a Gentile. It's not like, I mean, Cyrus of Persia was a Gentile. Elijah's a Gentile. He, he's, he's, he, he's a Tishbite. You can't find a clan of Tishbites in any of the tribes according to the genealogies provided. And he is an inhabitant. He's not from. He lives in Ramoth Gilead. Just to give you a frame of reference, he may as well have lived in Adam. It's a, it's a territory east of the River Jordan, north of Adam, and it's Arabs and Assyrians. And he lives there. The Jewish people did not come from Adam. They began in the Promised Land, returned from Egypt into Exodus, and were not allowed to pass through Adam. Huh. And returned from Europe after the Holocaust. Well, how's God coming anywhere if he doesn't have a man with him? How do we know anything about him if a man doesn't speak the words God tells him to speak? Did you think it was going to be a day of the Lord and he wasn't going to have a Moses? He's got a new covenant to deliver. It has to do with the first covenant. Well, who delivered it? Moses. It can't be the Jewish people. Okay, he's got to have a guy. One man. And he's got him described. He's a servant and he's righteous. So was King David. So was Elijah. And so was Moses. All servants. All righteous. One term. God's righteous servant. And I'm to believe from Rashi, Jews for Judaism, Outreach Judaism, that today the Jews are the righteous servant. Good luck convincing me. The witness report that they had never heard that the captain of the Lord's host is a Gentile and the harbinger of God's righteous servant who becomes the host of the Lord's host. It's, it's easy to understand. A man of divine beings is not an angel. A man of divine beings is a man that the Spirit alights upon and like Ezekiel enters, God is in his Spirit and then he speaks. We get that from Ezekiel. Chapter 11, Isaiah. The Spirit of God alights upon him. God is in his Spirit. He is now a man of divine beings. Any prophet that said, God says in his books, was a man of divine beings. You know, it's a task. It can be one task. It can be many tasks. One man just had to wrestle with Jacob. And God spoke. The divine beings, are, I know Judaism doesn't recognize the Holy Spirit for some unknown reason as a person. I don't know what could be more clear. There's just too many scriptural references. But that's a man of divine beings. Spirit lines on him. God's right there too. It's a man of divine beings, not an angel. The witness had never heard that the divine beings or the Holy Spirit who is the angel of his presence of Isaiah 63, an angel whose angelic body is not the form of a human with wings, but the very Spirit of God and God. The very angel who went before the Israelites in the Exodus and God was in him. Quote, this is God. I'm sending an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have made ready. Pay heed to him and obey him. Do not defy him, for he will not pardon your offenses since my name. That's Hashem. Since Hashem is in him. But if you obey him and do all that I say, that would be God, not me. I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. That's Exodus chapter 23, verses 20-22. The witnesses had never heard that God created his spirit, is in his spirit, and his spirit is the body of the angel of his presence and the angel of the Lord. How the angel of the Lord is in the burning bush and God speaks to Moses. How a man divine beings wrestled with Jacob and God spoke to Jacob. Renaming him Israel. 
how the ground was holy, where Joshua fell to the ground before a Gentile with drawn sword and asked, What does my Lord command his servant? The captain of the Lord's host answered Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. It's Joshua chapter 5, 14 through 15. Those are the very words God spoke to Moses at the burning bush. The Lord is with the captain, and where the Lord is, so is the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, a man in divine beings. How Elijah the Tishbite, an inhabitant of Ramoth Gilead, an Arab Assyrian town and land east of the river Jordan, is also a Gentile, host of the Lord's host. Okay, this one's a little involved, and I'm really trying to press through. So I'll, I'll just uh, refer you to the book where this comes from. It's called Isaiah 53 in the Day of the Lord. It's about 280 some odd pages. It has a long, almost 35 page summary of one paragraph of each chapter, which is uh, really helpful. But it's, it's a lot more than just Isaiah 53. <clears throat> and God dictated it to me as he dictated the Torah to Moses. How Ezekiel is the host of the Lord's host, a man in divine beings. This is uh, Ezekiel, it's in quotes. I'll give you the chapter in person in a second. And he said to me, O mortal, stand on your feet that I may speak to you. As he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet, and I heard what was being spoken to me. See, God, they show God saying those words, but Ezekiel can't hear them until the Spirit is in him. And God is in his spirit. He tells us, the angel, obey him, because my name, I am in him. This is God speaking to Ezekiel, but Ezekiel does not hear God speak until the same moment the Spirit enters him and sits him upon his feet. A spirit of God entering a man and God speaking means the angel of God's presence, who is spirit, alighted upon him and that God is in him. They could not believe how the Lord is symbolized in the story where he appeared and spoke to Abraham by the terebinths of Mamre as three men standing near him. The three men represent a host of the Lord's host. It's a man with divine beings. It's three persons. In my case, it's the person of Keith McCarty. It's the person of God. And it's the person of the Holy Spirit. All right here. And it's not new. This is all throughout the biblical, the, the Hebrew Bible. It just wasn't revealed to you. That's why nobody can believe it when they 